batteries. You couldn't do that with lead acid batteries. Insulate. And I think I found a way of fixing it. If you put anything in the way, 160 watts, wow! I received the Land Cruiser before Christmas and through the Christmas break I worked on it every single day since then almost every evening lots in the weekend and progress is actually really slow I mean, there's no camping equipment in it at all the batteries are not in it and they're on the shelf waiting to be put in and I can't even put a fridge in the back let alone a compressor and all the stuff I need to go on any kind of trip the thing is that there is still so much to be done and all I want to do is take it on a run I'm Andrew Cynthia White. Join me as I share my passion for building four-wheel drive trucks and travelling to the remotest parts of the world. Better put on the indicator, otherwise every YouTuber, self-righteous YouTuber. <laughs> so, I've had the car for three months and I've put 535 kilometres on it. <clears throat> so not driving it around very much. So what are you going to see now is a sequence of events that I have uh, um, put together. Some are filmed, were filmed when I first got the car, some were filmed last week, etc, etc. But what I am going to do is this Sunday, so uh, the details in the description, I'm going to run a live Q&A from my workshop. And um, you're welcome, to, as I said, in the description we'll find the time, so wherever you are, you'll be able to join us. And uh, you'll be able to ask any questions you like. So the idea is watch this video, get some inspiration for some questions, and then join me on Sunday. The sound insulation process. I have got all my stuff from the same place that I got my stuff for the Troopy build, which is Car Builders. And they supplied me with... Before, it was a kit for the troop carrier. This is the kit for the 79 dual cab. And it consists of two main elements. <clears throat> First is this insulation layer. Very, very thin sheet of aluminium. And underneath it, you can see here, quite clearly, this is quite a soft material. It is very sticky. And the way that this goes on first. So you know how car makers, expensive cars, uh, when you close the door, they go poof, as opposed to bang. Well, that's, I'm going to show you how they do it. It's not that their cars are made of heavier metal or anything like that. That's complete nonsense. What they do is they put this stuff on it. So I'm going to do a piece right here. So again, remember, all right, watch this. So let's see the difference. the sound before so there you go hey eh? that shows you how good this stuff is the next layer replaces this um, recycled carpet that most manufacturers will use as a sound insulation now because we don't want the floor to be too thick we must actually remove this because the replacement material is many 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 times more effective and as at insulating sound this closed cell foam layer is uh, it's pretty good for um, thermal insulation as well it's ideal for situations like if you've got a van and you want to you know um, or even a rooftop tent on the top of a roof to stop um, cool coming from the bottom this now is the acoustic aligner this is specifically for sound less so for heat and it is a double layer and the reason for that is what you've got is the steel of the car 
Then you have the black layer, which is also very dense and sticky. Then you've got a slightly denser layer, which is the aluminium. Then you've got here a, a layer of um, foam, which is easily compressed, so that's a very light layer. And then you've got a heavier, denser layer of foam. So basically you've got five layers, all in different densities. And that's how sound insulation works, because it doesn't travel well through densities of different densities. And then, as a final layer, again, two more densities, uh, a thick rubber and then a closed cell foam. This you would put around the transmission hump and up the firewall. But going up the firewall, you've got to be a bit careful. Now, in the driver's footwell, this is where you have to pay particular attention. You have to be extremely careful. And this does, I know it sounds like a safety announcement, but really, it's so easy to get this wrong. If you put anything in the way of your pedals, accelerator, brake, and clutch, particularly the brake, you, you might not know it until you're out there having to do an emergency stop. So make sure that you don't overindulge by putting sound insulation in this area here. Be very, very careful what you, you cover up. Just use common sense. I'm very lucky to have, quite close to my home, a store where I can actually get almost everything I need for the electrical installation. Normally I'd go to Bunnings for this and I'd go to the electrical wholesaler for this and I'd go to the spare parts place for this, but here a place called Perth Pro, it's not far from uh, Perth Airport. I can get absolutely everything, I think. So for example, rocker switches, but rocker switches you can get almost anywhere. But can you get the P-clamps you need for the cabling? No, you can't. And for example, if I'm running cables through uh, bodywork or anything like that, I'm going to have to have a proper, what are these things called? Glands. You see, proper ones, I can get them all in the same place. So actually, what I'm going to need is a shopping trolley. So for battery charging, the DC to DC from Red Arc, I'm actually using the same kit as I had in my troop carrier because it just worked very, very well. And the Victron battery monitor. So I'm, uh, I've selected some Heller uh, lights both uh, floodlights and driving lights. What I prefer to use for an electrical installation in a vehicle is double insulated wire. So, for example here. Now if you can see closely there, there's the outer casing, there's an inner casing, and I use double core, generally speaking, not single core, because I like to not rely unnecessarily on the vehicle's own earth. I would run a, rather run an earth cable directly to my earth source than to the bodywork, where possible. So that's the kind of cable that I'm going to need. What I also like to do is use multi-core cable. That's a five core and that is seven. Now the idea behind that is but if you've got a switch panel, I have in the front of my vehicles and there are five switches and it's, they're doing five different things. I could run five separate wires or I could use a multi-core and use a common earth. And that means that with one wire, I can do five different switching operations. And also, of course, single core, heavy duty cables that might be used for a winch, that might be used for a compressor, that might be used for a water heater boiler, and all the way down, you've basically got a fantastic range here. I'm going lithium. I've learned a lot about lithium. I'm beginning to understand lithium. And that battery, that 100 amp battery, weighs 12 kilograms. That's now 200 amp per hour, weighing not even as much as one AGM lead acid battery. But lithium isn't just better than AGM because it's lighter. No, 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 no. That, that's, that's not why it's better. That's just one of the reasons. The reason is that here I've got 100 amps, and here I've got 100 amps. It says so on the battery. 
But what it says on the side of the battery doesn't really tell you how much the battery will actually deliver. It'll tell you how much the battery will store, but not deliver. Lithium batteries, when compared to AGM batteries, are probably, and I'm not exaggerating, 50 to 60 percent more efficient. So these two batteries are the equivalent of four or five similar sized AGM batteries. Dollar for dollar, these are actually cheaper than AGM. A 100 amp hour AGM battery will give you 50 amp per hour of good solid current where the voltage is high enough, remains high enough, to run fridges and lights. And then at about half, 50%, the voltage starts to drop, the curve starts to drop, and eventually by 55 or 60% draw, things start turning themselves off. Lithium is the exact opposite, if you like, because, well, it maintains the voltage right until the very, very, very end. The, the, the curve is a very flat line, and then when it drops, so when measuring the voltage of a lithium battery to see how full it is, you're fooling yourself. It could be maximum voltage. You could still be getting wow voltage, and meanwhile the battery's got like 2% left in it, okay? These products are not the same, and they can't be treated the same. You know, for example, an AGM, you can put an AGM in under, un, under the bonnet, no problem at all, because they're far more tolerant to heat. You can draw, I mean, for example, you could use an AGM, although it's not ideal, but you could use it as a winch battery, and it would work pretty well. Forget about using a lithium as a winch battery. I've seen um, uh, advertisements for lithium batteries to put them in engine, in engine base. They say no need to change the charging and no need to change anything. They are very different from a, 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 a lead acid type battery. They behave differently, they need to be treated differently, they need to be charged differently. But again, are they lithium, are they cheaper? Let's have a look at prices. The AGM uh, deliver 50 amp per hour, $330 say for a good quality one, six, that's $6.60 per amp. And a good battery will give you five years of useful life before you have to replace it. That's, if you get five years out of an AGM, you're doing pretty well. Yeah, but it's not that uncommon. That's $1.32 per amp over five years. So let's have a look at these guys, okay? Lithium, this is 100, it'll give you 100 amp, or damn close to 100 amp, okay? For $900, that's $9 per amp. That's quite a lot more, but over 10 years, that's 90 cents as opposed to $1.32. So if you look at it that way, over the life of the battery, lithium is cheaper than AGM. I have fitted two Heller supplementary horns. I've left the original ones in place and wired up a small relay. And of course, I've got this lovely retro grill supplied by Toyota to replace the original one. Still look nice? This is definitely, the, electrically speaking, the most complex build I've ever done. And I'm going to be doing all of the electrics myself. Many people don't know this. The Land Cruiser 70 Series comes with two accessory fuse boxes already installed in the engine bay. I've seen fitment centers do electrical installations as if they don't know about these things. So I have to assume that they don't. In the, the glove compartment with the new vehicle comes a set of small electrical uh, clips. And they are designed to go underneath there. And so I've wired up four cables, which should be sufficient for me. And I can now just put, that's my fuse box. And the cabling is already there. I don't have to do anything. It saves a huge amount of work. And amazingly, a lot of people don't know about this. This is actually one of two. The other one is ideal. It's on the other side, further side. So the vehicle comes standard with all of this wired up. And there is the cable there. It is absolutely vital that you disconnect the battery completely uh, when doing wiring. So one of the things I need to do before I actually attach it is to label it. I need my label maker. 
So I've got four cables there and the different thicknesses. So all I'm actually going to do at this moment is put my the amperage fuse that I'm going to put in there. I can then label them properly later because I don't know what I'm going to attach to those uh, individual circuits. So I've got the first one I'm going to say is 15 amps. And then the second one is a bit thicker. I'm going to make that a 20 amps. Then th that one is actually quite thin and I'm going to make that 8 amps. And then the one up there, I'm going to make that 10 amps. A little bit of work in progress. Um, the sound insulation is now complete and the original carpets returned. The Department of the Interior Center console, I chose it in black to match the Bushman 15 litre armrest. It's a 15 litre armrest. It's actually, you know, I tried this before on my troop carrier and I actually cut it here and I, and I, I made a, a rudimentary arrangement with a snowmaster. The trouble is it was too high and um, as good as it was, it wasn't perfect. So I've gone for, they work together, Bushman and Department of the Interior actually worked together to get this right. And I can tell you now, it is absolutely perfect. It is the perfect armrest. Okay, it is just the right height. I can tell immediately. And of course, haven't bolted it in yet. It is a 15 litre fridge for my cold drinks. I'm not going to keep my back seat. I'm going to leave it out because I have another plan for this space here. But if you were to keep the back seat, then these cup holders are for the back seat passengers. At last, it's time to change the rims and tyres. I will be fitting a tyre pressure monitoring system using internal sensors. It's always nice to uh, take delivery of a new vehicle and then change its tyres because almost every single four-wheel drive vehicle sold in the world today actually is supplied with inadequate tyres. If you're going to use the vehicle for anything vaguely adventurous, Toyota is no exception to that. Now I have a long history with BFG and still even to this day think they are an excellent tyre. They are, I feel, riding a little bit on the very, very str strong brand name and I wanted to find something that was a little uh, less expensive, cheaper if you like, let's put it this way, equal or better value for money. My idea was to take on Falcon. I did some research, found their reviews exceptionally good, generally speaking. I also tested the Falcon Wild Peak Mud Terrain on a very successful trip in Australia last year and thought that's perfect, particularly in Australia, where the Falcon brand name is not particularly strong. It's got the brand to build here. They're far bigger and stronger in the US. They are 285 75 profile on 16 inch rims. These are the ROH rims that I originally had on my troop carrier. I decided that 33 inch was probably perfect. The endless discussion on mud terrain versus all terrain. I wish somebody would actually bring out a tire between mud and all terrain. Mud terrain, you get better traction in most off-road, if not all off-road conditions, including sand. You get more noise. You get higher wear rates. All terrain, much quieter. Better performance in the wet, much quieter. General road performance and gravel road performance, better. I never know what to choose. I want both. Bit of progress on the car audio system. I treated myself. These weren't cheap. Um, Focal is a French manufacturer of uh, car speakers and uh, the sound quality, I had them in the Troopy, absolutely wonderful. And I've gone one up from that system. This is a three speaker system. There's a woofer in there. There's the, um, I put this mid range here and then of course the tweeter will go in the A-pillar. And I had to do a little bit of work to get the, um, the mids to fit in here. Because, because the standard speaker that comes with the Toyota is, if you can imagine really terrible speakers, then you're just not imagining enough. The truth be told, my lawnmower makes a better sound than this. I don't know how to explain how bad 
the standard speakers in this car are. So but what I had to do here to, to modify this, this is a three inch and that space is a four inch for the mids. I had to make these and I made them on my 3D printer that I have. And that's basically what that is like that. It's painted and that will sit inside there. So as you can see, the daytime running lights are fitted. There they are there. And then as I turn my headlamps on, they will turn off. And then my high beam and my spot lamps. Dated on the box that this is an 85 watt light. I have tested it with an ammeter and it is an 85 watt light. Sometimes <clears throat> cheap lights will say 120 watts, 140 watts, you know, 160 watts, wow! And meanwhile you actually find out that they only draw 90 watts. So again a lot of lights, the inexpensive ones, not the good ones, uh, will can mislead you with wattage figures that are completely wrong. Not that uncommon. <clears throat> I think that looks very, very nice. The question, of course, is how good are the daytime running lights? I will actually do a, I'll do a test, actually, it looks long distance, see how much more visible they are than ordinary he headlamps. That'll be interesting. And um, I think the, uh, these are going to be pretty good. Thank you for watching. It's an ongoing process and I think this build is probably going to take me uh, a good part of four to five months. And that is before I get to what I'm going to be putting on the back. I've got two specific projects in mind. The whole, the beauty of the Trayback is that you can, I can use this as a utility vehicle and then I can put on a canopy with all my camping stuff in or I can put on a camper and well whatever I do is going to be able to be removed reasonably easily and with all of the, the water connections, electrical connections, again quite easy to do. So that's part of the long-term project with this vehicle. If you want to join me this Sunday, look on the details in the description for a live view. I'll be doing it, a broadcast in this. There will be Q&A, there will be, and I will answer any questions you would like on the development so far of the cruiser and what I'm intending to do with it. Lots of exciting things to come.